I don't know what's happening out here on the open range. Oh, yeah. Hello, I'm Dr. Kate Watson, an anatomic pathologist at the California Animal Health and Food Safety Laboratory, here to show you how to do a field necropsy of a cow. Some simple tools are useful for a necropsy. A sharp knife, a razor blade, scissors, and tweezers you probably already have at home. Pruners can be very useful for cutting ribs to expose the heart and lungs. Items you might not have at home, such as syringes, red top tubes for blood, and needles you can get from your local vet, a vet supply store, or even Amazon. First, we start with a physical examination. You can begin at the head, checking the ear tag number as well as any ta other tags um, that they may have. Working over to checking the eyes for any potential ulcers or swelling um, that may be causing um, bulbous protrusion of the eye. Make sure to also check your nasal cavities for any discharge, as well as the oral cavity. For any vesicular lesions, this is also a good opportunity to age the animal based on the incisors. All right, the ideal sample for some toxicologic testing is aqueous humor. In order to do that, you're gonna do a superficial puncture through the anterior chamber of the eye. You can see that this is really on the surface of the eye. You can even see the, the tip still there uh, um, in front of the iris or the colored portion of the eye and withdraw that clear fluid. You'll submit that in a you'll submit that in a red top tube. For vitreous, you need to stab into the back portion of the eye. Usually you if you go directly down the center, like I just tried to do, you will hit the lens and you won't be able to penetrate. So if you go in through the sclera, which is the white part of the eye, you can poke into the back of the eye to withdraw a very thick or viscous fluid, which is your vitreous. So the vitreous is viscous. The aqueous, which is in the front of the eye, is more watery. We will continue the examination by looking at the inner digital spaces and along the coronary band for any vesicular lesions, as well as a general overview of the skin, looking for any masses, as well as evaluating the overall condition of the animal. As we move around to the back, it's always good to examine the mammary glands. You can see there is a supranumerary teat here, which is just an incidental finding. Moving around to the back, evaluate for any signs of diarrhea, um, as well as on the tail base. You can use your body to lift the leg in order to stab into the axillary joint, but with larger animals, this can become tiresome. So we're gonna show you another method.
All right, stab incision into the axillary. And then this is a good time to pause to get blood. Taking a stab into the inguinal region. To connect your two incisions or I'll show you an alternate method as well. You want to make sure you're not going over the top of the skin as that will dull your knife. You want to make sure to go to that subcutaneous tissue. You can insert your knife like this, working upwards, going along. Alternately, you can use a razor blade. to connect those two. Then we need to reflect back the skin. Next, you're gonna find the costrochondral margin here. Here are the edge of the ribs coming into the sternum and then the abdominal cavity. Using your knife, can make sweeping incisions through each layer going layer by layer until you get to the peritoneum. At that point, you can put your knife into the abdominal cavity using the butt of the knife to push down on the viscera and the edge between the handle and the blade to reflect the abdominal muscles, giving you a good view into the abdomen. Next, we're going to remove the ribs. To do that, we need to reflect the muscles to allow us to cut the ribs away from the remaining of the carcass. To easily remove the rib cage, it can be helpful to make a handle using your knife. At this point, you'll have opened up a little bit more space to allow you to cut the diaphragm easily away from the sternum. The last, the last rib is always the hardest. There's always one more.
sometimes at this point it's easier to remove a majority of it and it looks like we've partially cut through it which is why it's so challenging but you can remove a majority and then use your knife to get the last bit as you open up the the chest and abdominal cavity this is a really good opportunity to evaluate the location of the internal viscera that includes here's the abomasum um, it's usually in that bottom kind of transition between the right and left cavities with the omasum sitting right here between the diaphragm and the abomasum the largest portion the rumen or should be the rumen. You can see the liver and the gallbladder sticking out here. The spleen is tucked down behind here as is your kidney. And then the kidney, which is encompassed in this perirenal fat here. And then a majority of the organs will be covered by this fatty layer of momentum. Now we will be extending our incision from the thoracic cavity up to the rostral aspect of the jaw, allowing us to remove the pluck. For anybody who may not be um, knowledgeable about what the pluck is, it includes the tongue, the esophagus, the trachea, all the way to the lungs and heart. To remove that, you need to extend that incision as far rostrally to the edge of the mandible as you can. Then you're gonna run your knife along the body here of the mandible on either side of the tongue. This should allow you to reach into the oral cavity and pull the tongue out through the incision. Removal of the tongue will require you to cut the frenulum, holding it in place in the oral cavity. As you continue to work the tongue back towards the thoracic inlet, you will come to the hyoid apparatus, which you will need to cut through the chondral junction between some of those bones. If you're finding that difficult to do, I also recommend utilizing your tools to cut them as well. Continue to work putting tension on the, on the tongue. Continue to work back, leaving as much muscling as you can behind, taking with you both the esophagus and the trachea. This will allow you to adequately evaluate by putting tension. You'll be able to cut through the space that divides the right and left cavities to evaluate whether there is lung disease on the downside, which should be the left side in this case. When collecting samples to submit to your diagnostic laboratory, what you want to do is to make sure that you put all of the 
individual tissues in individual bags to separate them from any contamination that may occur. This can be as easy as doing individual Ziplocs if you have them on hand, or if you happen to have some rectal palpation sleeves, it's just as easy to put the individual tissues into the rectal sleeve, tie off in between tissues, and submit as a tube of tissues. If you're worried about a bronchopneumonia, typically that is gonna be in the, what we call the craniovental region. That's gonna be your cranial lung lobes here. If you're worried about more of an interstitial pneumonia, that tends to be back here in the cotodorsal region. When sampling the lungs for a bronchopneumonia, it's really important to send in a large, minimally fist-sized sample so that we can culture um, without contamination. For example, if my craniovental lung lobes were affected in this case, which they are not, I would suggest sending in a sample like this so that the pathologist could sear the outside and take a sterile sample as well as collect for histopathology. All right, so for more of an interstitial disease or potentially lungworms, you may wanna submit some of that cotodorsal region. You still wanna take at least a fist-sized portion of lung that's affected, extending into the unaffected region and send that in as well. You can see the heart here is encased in peritoneum that's covered by fat. As we elevate that and stab into that cavity, we can evaluate for whether there's excess amounts of fluid. Some fluid is normal because it lubricates the heart, allowing normal movement. Remember that the left side um, makes up the apex and it has a thicker wall than the right side. Um, a good way to evaluate the heart is to make those bread loaf sections, starting at the tip, working your way towards the base. As you're doing this, you're just looking at the muscle to make sure that there are no regions that are really red indicating hemorrhage or regions that are very pale tan indicating um, necrosis. A good section to take and send in would be anything that's affected. Um, you can also take what we call the T-section, which is a section that includes the right ventricular free wall, the interventricular septum, as well as the left ventricular free wall. All right. The animals can get tongue abscesses, so you can draw your knife across in a bread loafing fashion to look for any abnormalities within the muscle. Continuing on, use your knife to open up the esophagus, looking for any signs of choke or ulcers in the mucosa. Do the same with the trachea. If you're on a downslope like us, <laughs> it can be a challenge to get the liver out because the rumen and the omasum will be putting quite a bit of pressure on it. Um, you can reach in to cut the deep attachments using the tip of your knife to put pressure and draw back on the tissue. You may leave some behind under these cir circumstances. You'll also need to cut through its attachment here at the duodenum where the bile duct 
enters. Exposing the portal vasculature. There are additional attachments here near the kidney and adrenal gland. As we talked about in the video, it's always good to draw your knife and bread loaf sections to look for any areas that may not be appearing on the capsular surface. Any affected region, um, you may have some areas of capsular fibrosis. Um, you can see a little bit of hemorrhage here. Any affected area, you wanna make sure to take, again, a fist size piece, including that capsular surface. There are a lot of uh, intestinal segments which would be hard to send in as a whole to your diagnostic laboratory. So as you're doing your field necropsy, you may wanna look through and find which are the affected intestines. Just as a caveat, um, as the intestines sit out longer, they will have normal color changes that can make it harder to determine what might be affected and what might not. You can see here, these all look pretty normal. But if I was collecting a sample to send into the diagnostic laboratory of affected jejunum, which is all of this intestine that's connected on the mesentery here, I might take a portion of the intestine that's affected, cut it off, and submit this later in a bag. If you're worried about diseases like yonis, um, an important area to take is gonna be that ileocecal junction. You can see this is the cecum, it's a blinded sac. On the other side of this is going to be your spiral colon. So make sure to sample the junction between the ileum and the cecum to look for any evidence of mycobacteria. The rumen is slightly air filled you can puncture it to release that air. You can see the rumen has papilla, long papilla. This is a good time to get a rumen sample, collecting from all of the different sacs if possible, and getting that watery fluid and any abnormal leaf structures. Here's the abomasum, the glandular portion. which has rugal folds. Versus the omasum, which has the leaf-like structures for filtering out large particles. <laughs> Underneath the attachment of the liver to the right kidney, at the cranial pole of the kidney, you'll find the adrenal gland within the perirenal fat. On cut section, you can see <laughs> that it has a cortex and med medulla. Within the perirenal fat here, you will find a lobulated structure that is the kidney. which you can remove. When looking at the kidney, you can place your hand flat on the top, draw your blade across the center, and then you can look for any areas that might be 
um, small abscesses or areas of necrosis. That's just where the tissue has died. A good sample is just to go ahead and take this size sample of your tissue. Again, putting it in your rectal sleeve or individual bag for examination. Within this caudal region, you will find tucked in the urinary bladder, which should be sampled for urine. And the uterus with the right and left ovaries. These can be opened up and you can see that there are some follicles as well as some corpus albicans. I hope you enjoyed this short video on how to perform a field necropsy. Remember, if you have any questions about sample collection, don't hesitate to reach out to your local diagnostic lab or veterinarian. If you're here in California, we are always available here at the California Animal Health and Food Safety Laboratory to assist you with questions you might have. Out here on the open range.